right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am delighted to be joined by Frank Soma, who is in Manhattan, New York today. How are you doing, Frank? Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. And Frank is a, is a lifelong salesperson who has used you know, neuro-linguistic you know, programming to develop his own approach to sales. And what we want to talk about today is the concept of B2B sales. So B2B sales, the Frank says, is really P2P, uh, which I presume you mean person to person or people That's to people. Right. So how to be high touch in a high tech world. And I think this is a great subject because we have become so used to technology being in the way, to being very hands off. And, uh, and it's become more and more difficult to be high touch, particularly in, per, in a person to person way. So, so Frank, uh, number one, what are the issues that you see facing salespeople today that uh, a high, that high tech world is really introducing and putting in front of them? Well, I, I mean, there are quite a few. So it works to our advantage in great ways where mm. I can reach out to people via LinkedIn. I can click on my Google News tab and drill down and I can know a lot about someone I'm going to see or I'm going to interact with uh, long before I see them. So the upside is that we have so much more information. Uh, but what I'm noticing is the downside is that, I mean, you know, John, as a lifelong said. Sales guy, I can tell you one of the most nerve wracking moments is when I call my client for the second, third, or fourth time and they don't get on the phone. And I'm like, Am I being a pain in the neck? What's going on? So I think salespeople today, understanding that feeling, opt for a quick email. And I find it's much less effective. I think there was a study that I'm sure you're familiar with back in UCLA in the late 60s by a guy named Maharabin who said that something in the neighborhood of 60 some odd percent of our message is delivered in body language. So if you think about that, and, and then another 30 some odd percent in my tone, email doesn't have either one of those. So to me, it's, it's the least effective form of communication, but it's so easy when I'm afraid to speak to someone or I'm nervous about speaking to someone, it's so easy to say, okay, I did my job. I, I reached out, I made a contact, I sent an email. But it's really not effective. And I think it's, it's just become between that text, messaging on LinkedIn, messaging on Facebook, et cetera. I think it's become more of a shield against rejection and, and a tool to say I'm doing my job, but I don't think that we're doing our jobs as effectively as we are. Yeah, those, I think that I totally agree with you. And I think the very interesting points is where you can, take, you can take all the advantages of technology and then use them actually to create disadvantages for yourself. And you're correct. Uh, uh, obviously, sales is a, high, is a high rejection business at the best of times. And you know, being able to rack up your activity numbers without actually having to talk to people, you know, it's, <laughs> I'm sure that's a, it's appealing to some people. Sure. So what are some of the ways that you can actually overcome this? Or what should, what should salespeople think about doing differently? Oh, I mean, I, I, I believe that you've got to, first of all, you've got to view yourself differently, right? When you enter into a sales interaction, we're so used to being rejected and we're so used to being this pariah that the media mm -hmm. uh, kind of tries to display us at. I mean, I love Tommy Boy as much as the next guy. <laughs> But to say that Chris Farley is a description of a professional salesperson is, is ridiculous. And you see in Tin Man and Glenn Gary and all of these crazy caricatures and, and phrases like snake oil salesman, you know, all these negative connotations along with sales. And I kind of equate it to, you know, my good friends are maybe doctors or lawyers or accountants or whatever. And I don't necessarily think that you know, that there's any advantage there. I mean, the greatest salespeople I know are take this job professionally and they study their craft. They know what they're doing. They're there to solve problems. I think salespeople, if you want to debunk that image that the media has to us, you've got to ask a ton of questions. Just keep asking questions and listen, be an uptime. One of the other things about technology and when I say, you know, high touch, sure. and I don't mean, you know, in, in a, I, and I mean in a good way, high yeah. touch, you know, today with, with the Joe Biden thing, I don't want to be misunderstood, <laughs> uh, you know, but, but it's, I think it's super important to break the mold, right? 
and not to let the technology get in the way. Another way that that happens is I'm speaking to someone and they take out their phone and check a text or I'm at dinner and somebody thinks that they're being polite by putting their phone face down on the table. You know, that's not polite. I wouldn't, you know, you go, go back to a hundred years ago, would somebody take out a quill pen and start writing, in the conversation, <laughs> writing a letter? You know, just don't do it. Just don't do it. Be, yeah. be a little bit more disciplined. In NLP, what we refer to as uptime means I'm completely engaged in listening to you. It means I'm, I'm using little, little eyebrow pops here and there. I'm grunting in the appropriate places. Maybe there's a light touch on the arm in the right place. My facial expression shows concern. I, 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 maybe I use the last couple of words in your sentence to prompt you to go on and tell me more, go backtracking. But there's a lot of techniques to listen really well. And I just, if I could tell, if, if I could offer a piece of advice to mm-hmm. every sales piece of person on the planet, it's really, you're never going to say some golden gem that closes the deal. Yeah. You're going to listen your way to a deal all the time. Yeah, and I think those are those are great points because yeah, I think we have we we have evolved into this casual culture, and we think that that it it is permissible everywhere. For instance, uh, you know, one of my one of my pet peeves is you know sending you the first email or maybe the first phone call we have and going, "Hey, Frank," as if I've known you all my life, you know, as opposed to you know earning my way there. But you're correct; it's all of these things, these habits we have of, yeah, oh yeah, just a second, I'm just going to reply to this text while you're talking and and things like that. And I think we have to be far more, as you say, far more conscious of what we're doing and what we're communicating. I do, and I I think there's a lot of avenues. To- that I mean, it's as simple as when you meet someone for the first time and understanding, you know, what that process is like. So for a salesperson, you know, some of the things you can do, you need to be squared up to somebody when you meet them. You know, the idea that you've got a phone in one hand, your attention is on the on the monitor in the bar, one of these ubiquitous televisions that seem to be everywhere that we are, and you're extending your hand but kind of not really shaking. You don't lean in, you don't make eye contact, you don't smile. All these little things that have, that have fallen by the wayside, I mean, our little lizard brains haven't changed. You know, you, there's a great book out now called Sapiens, and if you look back to what's gone on and, you know, over, over millennia, uh, there are certain things that are just in our DNA. And when you meet someone, I mean, has this ever happened to you, John? Have you ever met somebody for the first time? And they say hello and you shake hands, and something about them that you really don't like? Yeah. You don't even know what it is, mm-hmm. right? So you're not, not identifying, you're not going, boy, that's a really awful tie, or I, I don't like the way, you know, that they came. No, it's just something wasn't right. And I would submit to you that it was, he violated one of those things I just talked about. They either weren't squared up, or they didn't smile, or they didn't make eye contact when they first met you, or they didn't lean in a little bit on the handshake. You know, there's all these things that are part of how we communicate and and as human beings, you know, that old lizard brain is just calculating this stuff and adding up all of these little things and making judgments. And as salespeople, you know, it's really incumbent upon us to be conscious of these things and be completely present in every interaction so that we don't send this incongruous message to the person we're talking to. And, and it's interesting, and it's interesting, Frank, because this, and it's unfortunate in many ways, but doing all these things now can actually differentiate you in some ways because they're falling by the wayside a little bit. So if you are, if you are very conscious, if you do, so Frank, in, in some ways, this can be a competitive differentiator for you as a salesperson, because a lot of these, uh, a lot of these things are falling by the wayside, as you say, and people aren't paying attention to them. So if I pay attention to making sure that how I interact with you when I meet you, it can actually be a surprise to the other person go, wow, this guy's very really friendly, he's very engaged, he's very polite, he, he, he never took out his phone once, all of these things. So right. for people watching here, this can, going, going old school here can actually, um, uh, can actually be a huge competitive right. advantage today. I think so. And I think, you know, I want to be really clear that there are clients of mine that prefer that I communicate in email. And I know that because I've got taken the time to get to know them. So with those people I use email all the time 
I use LinkedIn all the time. I go live on Facebook. I, um, I broadcast a video message to my blog each week. I love the technology we have at our fingertips, and I think we ought to utilize it to the best of our advantage. Um, what, I, what I'm emphasizing is, like you said, it could be a differentiator. You know, I don't think that anyone, or most of the time, folks are not going to say, boy, that guy made great eye contact, and he never looked at his phone while he was talking to me. But what they will say is, man, I really enjoyed meeting John. Mm -hmm. They won't even know why, but, but they, they'll enjoy it. You know, you, we, we've heard of or seen charismatic people in our lifetime. Sure. What is it that makes someone charismatic? They make you feel good about yourself. Mm -hmm. And how do you make someone feel good about themselves? By listening attentively and prompting them to continue to speak to you and paying close attention and being interested in what you're saying. You know, Dale Carnegie, if you go way back to sure. how to influence friends, you remember he said, don't forget that that guy you're talking to is more concerned about his toothache than an earthquake that kills 10,000 people in another country. <laughs> you know, this, this is, you got to remember it's about others and then selling it's super important. Yeah, and, 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 the, and the rule of communication is that people, uh, people believe conclusions, they come to themselves than anything you can say to them. So as you said, through your conversation and your questioning, et cetera, you got to help them come to the conclusions themselves. Yes, absolutely, for sure, for sure. Yeah. So the other interesting thing is, you know, some people will, will watch this and say, okay, but I do most of my selling virtually now. I don't actually go out and meet people. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but look at what we're doing here today. We still, the technology can still work for us to make a connection. You can see me, I can see yeah. you. you, know, you can, we can still use the technology to, mm -hmm. to engage and at least start the relationship on a more personal level, right? Yeah, I agree. And I also think that we can't fall into the blind, you know, uh, that blind spot that says I'm using technology and I may not be person to person. I understand that. But I also understand that, you know, throughout the history of, of my career in sales, I have seen a hundred examples of people that were that excelled on the on the telephone. Mm -hmm. So what did they do that was different than someone else? You know, most of the people I saw that were really good had signs on their desk that said smile or a mirror that they looked in while they were talking. So they didn't just zone out, but they were conscious. And because, you know, listen, physical, physicality is the number one thing, right? Uh, if you think about it, your actions can change your attitude. Your, mo mo your motion will change your emotion. Your movements can change your moods. So... I find that if I'm with a prospect on the telephone or any important conversation, I stand up yeah, yeah, when I'm yeah. talking. I always use a headset and I get up so I'm hands free. It, you know, that energy, that smile comes across. Do you know how many times I've had it before I learned not to do this? Do you know how many times I've had somebody say to me on the phone, Frank, Frank, I lost you because I was responding to an email while I was talking to them? You know, this, you're not multitasking. You're not yeah. fooling anyone. They didn't hear the keys going. I had this quiet little laptop. But yeah. they heard the miss in my attention. They felt the change in my energy. You know, this is super important stuff. People feel this over the phone. So regardless of how you're selling, whether it's by phone or in person, that energy and these things I'm talking about, this being squared up and listening, it, it all plays. It all plays. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I love that multitasking one because I always say multitasking is really doing a, bun a bunch of things badly. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. yeah, but but I totally I totally agree with you, and I think that's a great uh, it's a great takeaway for people about standing up uh, and being in the. I I learned that a, a long time ago. But if you ever do, and this is for not just for salespeople, but if you're doing a job interview over the phone, stand up. Right. You know, as you say, get your headset on, stand up so that you and be animated and that will come across to the person on the other end of the phone and they'll be like wow yeah. this person is really engaging like you said you don't have to be you don't have to see them but you can feel their engagement and as you right. say it, it's very hard to get distracted if you're walking around the room really getting into what you're talking about right right and the, and the, and the smiles are a big deal too get on the phone and consciously smile through your conversation and, and listening well, you know, the lack of distraction, as you said, is a big deal. And I think that, you know, one of, the, one of my go-to strategies, when I go to do a, a, a keynote talk or a sales training with a team, I work a lot, a lot, a lot on listening mm -hmm. and getting folks, prompting people to speak and using all the techniques that, 
help someone else to feel good about themselves because at the end of the day, you're responsible for the result of the communication. And I, and I believe that as a salesperson, you know, I've never been a fan of, you know, well, the marketplace is no good or my product is no good or my company is no good, you know, all of that stuff. It's the number one thing for us is personal responsibility. It comes down to us all the time, our success or our failure. You know, when you're in a sales position, you've got to act like the checkbook's on your desk and you have to make payroll on Friday because you really do. You know, it's in most classic sales environments, your your livelihood is dependent on how productive. Yeah, for sure. And and by the way, I, li- I like that reiterate the thing about listening, because I do think it's a, it, it's a skill that probably is getting lost a little bit now, particularly because we have all these devices and we love being distracted all the time. But uh, in, 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 uh, in couples or family therapy, one of the techniques that they use, and I think this is fascinating, is is if you if you and I Frank were in couple therapy, there you go. There's a vision for you. Um, <laughs> um, but John, we've just met. I know, I know. We're already in therapy. <laughs> um, but it's one of the things is the, the therapist will get one person to speak, and then before the other person can answer, they have to repeat back what the person said and repeat it back and repeat it back until the person who originally said it agrees that that's what they said and even and and that is an interesting technique because we have to train ourselves to really listen to what the person is saying rather than start thinking about what we're going to say next yeah i think that's really important i've written in my blog an awful lot about that idea. I've seen, you know, I've had conversations as you have with folks whose lips are moving mm-hmm. as you're finishing a sentence. One of the things that I do in the trainings is, and it's super uncomfortable, but I do it to get them to get this feeling and make a point is I pair off people and I say, okay, uh, person A, you're going to reveal something that's very important to you. Person B, you need to maintain eye contact and wait 10 seconds before you reply. John, it's an eternity. Then I asked them, you know, how did that feel? And they're all like, oh my God, that was forever. I couldn't look. But it's 10 seconds is a long time, but it's just to emphasize the idea that you have really been in what we refer to in NLP as uptime, that you really were engaged and listening and letting that person know through your eyes, through your face, through your body, through your tone, through everything that you were indeed engaged in what they were saying. Yeah, I, I love that, Frank, because that's another thing that is, is people are so afraid of silence, right? And especially in a, in a sales context, it's like if there's a gap of silence, like most people feel like I need to fill that void now. And it's oh. like when, especially if, if the person that you're selling to goes silent for a moment, well, you maybe just ask them a question, maybe a challenging question, and, they, and you need to remember that they actually need time to think about it before they answer, but instead you go, ah, silence, I need to dive in. <laughs> right, that's very true, and I think it's part of what happens in, in fulfilling the stereotype, right? So the, the negative stereotype that we have with salespeople is that they talk too much, or they have slick answers, or they're too quick, or... So I think it's even more important for us in breaking the stereotype to slow down, to ask more questions, to listen more. You know, I've often talked about when you're in with a prospect, you know, those chess clocks all over the city when the guys are playing in the springtime sure. outside. So they hit the clock to see how long between moves. If there's a chess clock on the desk and you're with a prospect, at the end of an hour, it better be 15 minutes, even 45 minutes Mm-hmm. You know, that's what you're striving for. You want to really engage them and draw them out. And, and the other thing to really remember is that we're talking about technology before, that with the technology we have today, you know, let's go way back when salespeople brought you the information that you didn't have. Mm-hmm. So you relied upon the salesperson to deliver the information. And, and then when they delivered that to you, they had to pour all of this into you. Today, when I go to see my prospect, they have the information. They probably know more about my product than I do because they've been doing the research. Sure. So when I show up, my job is really to shepherd them to the process, through the process, to ask them good questions, to help them to understand why my company and I are the best option for the product that they're already looking at and they already understand. 
Mm -hmm. And I think another point, uh, and Frank, and you're 100% correct there, that, they, that uh, prospects of all this information, but in some ways it's gotten to the point where they have so much information, they don't know what to do with it. It actually can lead to decision paralysis because that's, that's I think, what people are seeing more and more is losing out to no decision because, yeah, you have all this information, but then you're like, ah, I, I don't know what to do with it. So they to your point the salesperson who can come yeah. and really help them cut through the noise and really understand what they're trying to right. achieve is right. going to win out right and you and you've got to be you know you've got to bring big value i i believe that my clients call me for my services my clients also call me for other services they see me as tuned in they see me as connected and they see me as trustworthy and when those things happen they call me, you know, I know a guy, a um, wonderful guy, his name is uh, Bob Shurtmanian, and he's uh, an owner of an exit realty franchise. I, I got to tell you, I call Bob for everything because I just, I'm not selling my house, but I just see him as a guy who's plugged in and connected. Right. And that's how I want to feel as a salesperson. If I need any service in the world, I call Bob because I feel like he's going to know somebody because I, I view him that way. And I think that's how... We want to be viewed to our customers in a sense that when we're having a conversation with them and they mention that they need, you know, Bob Shervanian is, um, is the owner of an exit realty franchise in New Jersey. And I was just saying how he's a salesperson and he's my go-to guy for a lot of things. If I need something, I call Bob because I feel like he's connected. Well, listen, um, Frank, we're bumping up against the end of our time. This has been great. But before we go, I'd like you to tell people a little bit more about yourself and how they can get in contact with you. 